Want to make a million dollars? Well, I have got a deal for you. All you need is a pencil, some paper, and the ability to solve one of the hardest math problems in human history. No big deal. When I say hardest math problems, I don't mean calculating a tip without your phone or splitting it between 10 people. We're talking about problems so mind-bendingly complex that the world's greatest mathematical minds have banged their heads against them for decades or even centuries with no real success. Welcome to the Millennium Prize Problems. Before we tackle these problems though, let's understand what research level mathematics actually looks like. In school, math meant following clear steps to solve well-defined problems. Your teacher already knew all the answers, and if you followed the right formula, you'd get the right result. Easy peasy. But research math? Mm-mm. There is no answer key. No one even knows if the solutions exist. There's no established procedure. Research mathematicians are explorers at the edge of human knowledge, but instead of spaceships and sexy engines, they have, like, scribbles on napkins and empty coffee cups. <laughs> to put it more precisely, research mathematicians have to invent new tools, so functions and algorithms and concepts, theorems, abstract definitions, and frameworks as they go. They might be trying to prove something which is actually false or be trying to disprove something which eventually turns out to be true without any blueprint for how to approach the problem in the first place. Some people say pure math is a subfield of philosophy. Some people say philosophy is a subfield of math. Either way, it's a process of creative exploration, rigorous logic, and often countless dead ends before any kind of breakthrough occurs. Okay, so even though the whole point of the Millennium Problems is that they are super complex mathematical concepts that could each be the subject of their own video, or the subject of an entire college course, or an entire lifetime of research, I am still gonna do my best to break them down into little bite-sized treats for you. Consider them like samples at Costco, not the full meal, just a little, little bit. Here it goes. P versus NP. Imagine you're trying to solve a Rubik's cube. It's super hard, right? But if somebody hands you a solved cube, it's very easy to verify that it's correct. That apparent difference between checking a solution and finding a solution is essentially what P versus NP is all about. It asks, is finding solutions inherently harder than checking them? P problems are ones we can solve quickly. NP problems are ones where we can check answers quickly. Proving P equals NP would mean proving that there exists an efficient way to solve any puzzle that can be efficiently checked. To be clear, P equals NP wouldn't mean all problems suddenly have the same solution or that there's one magic algorithm that can solve everything. Rather, it would mean that for any problem where we can quickly verify if an answer is correct, there must also be a way to quickly find that answer in the first place. The work of actually going out and finding those algorithms would be a completely different task, but if P equals NP, it would mean that some clever solution is always out there. For a bit of perspective on why that's important, most modern encryption codes fundamentally rely on the fact that in one direction, verification, they allow for checkability in seconds, while taking billions of years to solve via brute force. As a nice simple example, consider the problem of factoring. If someone hands you a nice little number, like say 1,598,799, and asks you to find all of the numbers that divide it, it might take you quite a while to figure them out. But on the other hand, if they asked you to check if it's specifically divisible by 23, 17, 3, 29, and 47, you could do that relatively quickly with just a calculator. If P were equal to NP, it would mean that there must be a flip side quick way to just look at 1,598,799 or any other number, no matter how big, and with relative relative ease and quickness, just be able to know exactly which numbers divide it. For the record, most experts believe P does not equal NP, but no one has proven it either way. Bounty unclaimed. The Riemann hypothesis. The rock star of math problems since 1859, it's all about finding order in the seemingly random distribution of prime numbers. Those special numbers divisible only by one and themselves. So like two, three, five, seven, 11, etc. Prime numbers are like the atoms of mathematics. They're the fundamental building blocks from which all other numbers are constructed. And despite their fundamental importance, they appear scattered throughout the number line, like teenagers at a mall with no obvious pattern. Except that 17,351 is so fetch. Stop trying to make fetch happen. It's not going to happen. But seriously though, if this sounds surprising, then you were paying attention because it is surprising. Prime numbers, a set of numbers defined by a concept simple enough to be taught to grade school students, and which seem like they should be governed by some sort of predictable pattern, are actually interwoven with an infinitely complex element of apparent randomness. For instance, as numbers get big, it typically becomes harder and harder to find primes because they spread out on the number line. But yet, if you look hard enough, you can always somehow find primes that are separated by just one number in between them, called twin primes. 
no matter how far down the number line you go. Kind of crazy. This almost mystical balance of order and chaos is part of what makes primes so interesting. There is no precise formula which tells you exactly how to find the next prime number in an efficient manner. And that's what the Riemann hypothesis is all about. Well, technically it's about the zeros of the Riemann zeta function lying on the same line of a complex plane, but if proven true, it would give us a much better roadmap than we have ever had before to describe how the prime numbers are distributed throughout the number line. That would be a pretty big deal. Bounty unclaimed. So not gonna lie, this video was a lot of fun to make because believe it or not, I don't actually know that much about advanced math. Like obviously you have to learn some pretty high level stuff when you study engineering, but this kind of math, I ended up falling down a rabbit hole of theoretical math to prep for this video and I have no regrets. Hot take, but I think learning new stuff is a lot of fun and chances are, if you're watching this video, you're the same way. That's why I wanna introduce you to this video sponsor, National University. NU is one of the biggest accredited nonprofit universities in the country, with over 40,000 students and 230,000 alumni. They offer over 150 degree programs, credentials, and certificates, and have spent more than 50 years providing innovative learning and support models for working and other non-traditional students. Going back to school can feel daunting if you've already got a full-time job or have a family to take care of, or any other commitment that doesn't leave you with much free time. That's why NU offers flexible four and eight week online courses to make pursuing your education achievable. And if you're looking for ways to balance tuition with your regular life expenses, they've got your back. Over 50% of National University students were awarded financial aid, scholarships, or discounts last year, totaling almost 55 million in student aid. No matter where you are in life, you deserve the chance to pursue higher education. Whether you're looking to make a career change, finish that degree you never got a chance to complete, or take a few classes for personal enrichment, National University is here to support you. Give yourself a chance to pursue the education you deserve by clicking the link to learn more. Thank you so much to National Universities for sponsoring this video. Now, back to our bounties. The Navier-Stokes equations. This next one should be near and dear to the hearts of everyone who loves to fly planes, surf the seas, or, you know, like, breathe in air. <laughs> And that's because the Navier-Stokes equations are the mathematical heart of fluid dynamics. Think of these equations as the grand unified theory of fluid motion. Engineers and physicists use them every day. Okay, but wait, you might be thinking, if they're already in use, what's left to solve? Great question. Here's the thing, in mathematics, solved means something very specific. The Navier-Stokes equations are differential equations which describe how fluids change over time. Engineers can approximate solutions using computers for specific scenarios, like air flowing around a wing, but mathematicians want to know if the equations behave well in all possible scenarios. It's like the difference between successfully baking a cake 10,000 times and mathematically proving that the recipe will never fail under any circumstances, like if you were to bake it at the center of a black hole. Engineers have been baking fluid dynamics cakes successfully for decades, but mathematicians want absolute proof that there aren't some extreme edge cases where the mathematical model breaks down. Specifically, the Millennium Prize question asks, do the Navier-Stokes equations always have well-behaved solutions? Or could they blow up under certain conditions, developing points where the mathematics breaks down? This isn't just mathematical nitpicking, it gets at whether our fundamental understanding of fluid dynamics is complete. Solving this would improve everything from weather forecasting to designing better airplanes to understanding blood flow in your body. Also, you'd be a million dollars richer. Bounty unclaimed. The Hodge Conjecture. Buckle up kids, cause this one is wild. The Hodge Conjecture asks whether certain mathematical structures that look like they could be geometric actually are geometric. Imagine trying to approximate complex shapes by gluing together simple geometric building blocks of increasing dimension. You got points, you got lines, you got triangles, you got tetrahedra, and so on. Seems random, but aren't you looking at my complex face being approximated by a bunch of little geometric pixels right now? The Hodge Conjecture essentially asks if it walks like a geometric duck and it quacks like a geometric duck and tastes like a geometric duck, is it actually a geometric duck in disguise? And while this sounds totally abstract, because it absolutely is, a solution would revolutionize our understanding of multidimensional spaces and potentially help with everything from string theory to quantum computing. How, you ask? In string theory, physicists model our universe using complex geometric shapes with extra dimensions. The Hodge conjecture would give mathematicians powerful new tools to analyze the fundamental properties of these shapes. It's like going from having a blurry photo of a house to having complete architectural blueprints. Blueprints which could potentially help physicists resolve fundamental questions about how space-time is structured at the quantum level. In short, the Hodge conjecture would provide a mathematical framework to better understand shapes in higher dimensions, which is exactly what string theorists and researchers in several other fields of very abstract study need. Bounty unclaimed! Yang Mill's existence and mass gap. 
The Yang-Mills theory is the mathematical foundation for much of modern particle physics, underpinning our understanding of the fundamental forces of nature, except for gravity. It describes how particles like quarks interact through forces carried by particles like gluons. The Millennium Problem has two parts. First, proving that a proper mathematical formulation of quantum Yang's-Mills theory exists. Currently, physicists use approximations. And then second, proving it has a mass gap, which means the particles it describes can't have arbitrarily small masses. This mass gap is crucial because in real life, even though fundamental particles in quantum mechanics are super tiny, they aren't arbitrarily small. So our math should tell us why that is. Bounty unclaimed. Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture. All right, Editor's Alley here. So in this section, we are going to talk about birch swinnerton dyer conjecture and relate it to its potential use in calculating spacecraft trajectory. But after seeing it animated, we realized that basically we misinterpreted a paper on its applications, which I have linked down in the description below. And the script went through multiple rounds of fact checking. And I feel like the fact that it slipped through that is a testament to how dang complicated this math is. So. As we're filming, like as I'm filming this right now, the video has to go live in two days. So we unfortunately don't have the time anymore to rewrite it and like create new animations. So instead, here is a very simplified explanation of the conjecture. So elliptic curves are a very special type of curve that seem to have both geometric and arithmetic properties. However, mathematicians suspect that there's a way to translate their geometric properties into arithmetic properties, making it a fully arithmetic object in the same way that like linear curves and quadratic curves are. So the BSD conjecture would be the way that we would do that translation. And yeah, that's, that's about all I can tell you. If you want to learn more about the conjecture, I've put some links to people who definitely do know what they're talking about down in my description. And uh, yeah, very humbled. Editors I let out. Bounty still unclaimed. The Poincaré conjecture. Man, my French is gonna get roasted. The Poincaré conjecture was the first and so far only millennium problem to be solved. It asks a seemingly simple question. How do you know when something is a sphere? Or more precisely, when a given shape can be shaped and molded into a sphere without tearing it. Turns out it's not so simple. Coming up with a working definition and proving it defines the right category of shapes took almost a hundred years. Poincaré posed the conjecture publicly in 1904. And in 2003, Russian mathematician Grigory Perelman proved it using a technique called Ritchie flow with surgery. The proof was so groundbreaking that Perelman was awarded both the Fields Medal, which is like the Nobel Prize for math and actually way rarer, and the Millennium Prize. And in a stunning move, he declined both, which is either extremely noble or very bonkers, depending on your student loan situation. Certainly wouldn't happen in this country, I can tell you that. So now that I have done such an amazing job of breaking these problems down to their tiniest details so that you understand them completely, I gotta ask the obvious question. Why are these problems worth a million dollars each? Sure, they're difficult, but so is eating one Lay's potato chip or building an airplane, and no one pays me for that. Not that I've ever achieved either of them yet. Well, first off, these problems aren't isolated puzzles. They're gateways. Solving any one of them would unlock new mathematical tools and understanding that could be applied to countless other problems. They're like the master keys to entire wings of the mathematical castle. Second, while pure mathematics might seem abstract, it has a remarkable tendency to become unexpectedly practical. Number theory led to modern encryption. Non-Euclidean geometry gave us Einstein's general relativity, without which none of your cell phones or any satellites or GPS-reliant tech would work. Today's theoretical math often becomes tomorrow's technological revolution. And third, there's the pure intellectual achievement of the thing. These problems represent fundamental gaps in our understanding of the universe. Solving one of these problems would mean you've pushed the boundaries of human knowledge further than anyone else has been able to for decades or even centuries. And in my opinion, that's worth celebrating and rewarding. So there you have it, six different open problems, each worth a million dollars. And if one of you decides to quit your job tomorrow and solve one of these problems and becomes a millionaire, just remember who introduced you to the topic in the first place. <laughs> Patreon.com slash Xyloboxlin is always there for you. <laughs> also, this video was definitely a departure from my usual topics, even more so than some of my science videos. So if you enjoyed this mathematical adventure, please let me know in the comments and also, be sure to hit that like button and also subscribe while you're at it. A huge thank you to my Patreon supporters who make these videos possible without requiring me to solve any millennium problems. So until next time, happy solving.